All right, that's Mo and Deej. Very welcome along to Wednesday mornings, OTBAM. It's been one of those weeks, hasn't it? Uh, yeah, so get in touch. 087 is the WhatsApp number. You can leave a comment in the YouTube stream or wherever it is, however you want to get in touch with us. We're pretty much on that platform these days. There's even a little bit of a seeping on to TikTok. Have you been on TikTok much? No, I don't, I don't have the app. It used to take up too much room on my phone. And How does it I, take I, up a lot of room? Yeah, and since I changed phone, I haven't really got back into it. But I, I think I think I put up a couple of... Uh, a couple of TikToks of the crappy quiz uh, on my own account uh, just to see how the youth of the world reacts and turns out that they um, didn't react very well at all and they've got no interest whatsoever in oh, uh, really? sports trivia being carried out by middle-aged men. I think you probably needed to do a better hashtag job. I see people just put up hashtag viral and, and it seems to work. It's like, <laughs> shit video, I'm going to use the hashtag viral and it's like, oh, right, okay. It's a bit of a self-fulfilling hashtag prophecy right there. Yeah. yeah. Can we um, do that with our stream this morning? If we go hashtag viral on Twitter? Uh, we can say a very good morning to all our millions of viewers around the world. Uh, why not? Uh, it takes up a lot of space mentally, it turns out. It's oh, like, yeah? It's like crack cocaine. I've heard that, but, like, if it's good... Like, but I mean, if it's, it's shit, it's, For me, it's like bad crack tongue. cocaine. Well, I mean, is there good crack? I don't know. They're, they're like, I mean, for I me... I realise you're a connoisseur of crack. I just... There's, there's top tier and then there's average tier, and uh, I kind of find that it's like, it's not even that addictive. Because this the content it can be by and large mediocre, but I think by apparently the algorithm just needs to get to know you, and then after a period of time your feed gets very good. I don't really want that though, you know. <laughs> no, like that's that's the bit where it gets dangerous. Um, are you just too old for it? Is that what happened? Is there like a bit of your life where you're like, oh, I missed that one? Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I would never, re- I, I couldn't really see myself producing one of the classic TikToks, you know, the sort of, you know, your your bread and butter TikToks, like... Sounds like a challenge. Like like uh, that that weekend song, uh, that, which was obviously the, the start of lockdown and, and any other dance-related TikTok, just, yeah, that, that would certainly have passed me by. Uh, I'm not a dancer. Not, it doesn't, doesn't really fit in with me. And if you can't dance, I, you're in the back foot immediately on TikTok, I, I find. I would have assumed your food reviews would have been... Uh, Perfect. My food reviews are like seven minutes long. TikTok crack fodder. TikTok is like, what, 30 seconds long? I, I think that uh, I... Several of the ones I was watching were like two minutes. Oh, yeah? Oh, probably different, multiple parts, is it? Yeah, Maybe there's not. like a click, click, click. Yeah. Oh, okay, so it's like an Instagram story. Uh, essentially, yeah. Right, okay, so maybe, maybe there is a home for that uh, on TikTok. There you go, there's, there's, there's an idea for next year. That's our production meeting for today. Right, there is actually lots for us to talk about, including the uh, Republic of Ireland under 21. So they, they, they didn't change their grade like the GA. It would have been interesting if the uh, age grade had changed in GA and then the world of football, FIFA, like, that's a great idea. <laughs> it's too much to ask of these guys. Uh, they won 1-0 last night with um, a stoppage time Ireland goal. We like to score late. Part of our football culture is now scoring late. That's what we've decided. Mm. It's in our national... So our national identity, as Matt Williams would tell us, not, never to give up. We're just going to keep adding stuff on. That's positive to what Matt Williams told us yesterday. Mm. It's our foundational text was the Braveheart speech given on the plains of Kildare, which we all know historically, that's where it happened. Um, on the Curragh, wasn't it? That's where it was. I think so. Uh, yeah, so he came on yesterday, told us how great we were. We were like, yeah, you're right, we are great. And then obviously the Republic of Ireland in 21 last night, we're listening to him and we're like, yeah, we are great. Clearly, uh, the, the under-21s, obviously, um, a, a team that's got a lot of attention over the last little while because of the players that essentially aren't playing last night, the ones that have made the step up to senior level and that would be underage last year. And when you watch back the goal, uh, I think that they were actually talking about that exact point and saying, you know, it's okay to draw nil all here uh, as soon as uh, as soon as soon uh, O'Neill buries to the back of the net. Like, I mean, it was Crawford kind of has to take some credit for that. The, the substitutions he made and went for it late on in, in the game and, and a massive result to kind of keep the whole thing alive. There was disappointment, a little bit of disappointment, losing to uh, an excellent Italy side last week. But uh, getting one over Sweden and even listening to, to Ali O'Neill after the game, it's kind of like we're, we're as good as these guys. We, we, we feel that we should be beating these guys every so often and, and that's exactly what they did. So it was a phenomenal result and kind of came off the back of a, of a brilliant performance as well. The last 10 minutes were loads of chances created for from an Ireland perspective. There were a few for them. Our goalkeeper was actually pretty good at uh, patrolling his half. Nathan Murphy is with us, I think. Nathan, good morning to you. Morning, lads. How are you? I'm very well. Uh, so the Republic of Ireland 21s, very briefly on that, uh, missing, I don't know how many of the senior players are actually would have been qualified to play. Is Jason Knight too old or is he still underage? I think he might just miss out, but Adrian Domodelo would be there. Gavin Bazuna would be the goalkeeper. Uh, Adam Eda would be still available. Troy Parrott would be in there Aaron as well. So there's quite a few. Aaron Connolly be, depending on... I it's suppose, only 20 it, still. It, it's the time when the 
when it starts. So he may oh. well have been. And uh, Knight then, as 20, would have been in there. So, like, every team is missing several players at under-21 level who are in and around um, senior squads. But like, that was a huge, huge win for them last week. And, like, Ollie O'Neill is only 18. He's with Fulham. He was on the bench for a League Cup game a couple of weeks ago, but 18 years of age and the composure, because when the ball came to him initially, this was the very last kick of the game. When it came to him initially, he thought, hit it first time. But he just settled himself, settled himself, and gives Ireland half a chance of qualification. They still have to go to Sweden. They still have to go to Italy. Uh, but they've definitely given themselves a chance. And I was at the game against Italy on Friday night, and it didn't feel like it was a very good Irish performance. You kind of had to keep reminding yourself, though, that actually they're playing Italy here. They're playing a real quality outfit. And the players who stood out that day, I thought, were Coventry and Kilkenny in the middle of midfield. And again last night, that I would say will be the last time Gavin Kilkenny will play for the Irish in the 21s because he has a huge future with the senior team ahead of him. He's playing pretty much every week in the middle of midfield for Bournemouth, who are top of the championship. He just can control a game got a real zip, a real energy about him in midfield. Coventry is a bit more of the Josh Cullen type. Uh, maybe it's too easy a comparison, uh, but he's a bit more of that Josh Cullen, just nice, tidy little passes. But Kilkenny has a little bit of an X factor about him in the middle of midfield, and I'd be shocked if he's not in the senior squad for the friendlies in March. What, when you say he's a midfielder, central midfielder, a six, an eight, a six and a half? Well, he, he, the, the two of them sort of played as, as a double pivot. Uh, but whereas I think... Coventry's natural game feels to be the one who sits that little bit deeper. Kilkenny has the ability to play as that number eight, to skip past people. I think he has a better range of passing. He has a bit more energy about him as well. Uh, so uh, maybe they are the Cullen and Hendrick of the 21s that they fit together perfectly. And this is a huge step up, clearly. But the fact that he's Bournemouth are running away with the championship and he's playing for them in the middle of midfield uh, suggests that you know, Scott Parker certainly believes that he's he's good enough for that level. Uh, you hope this a promotion to the Premier League means he continues being good enough for that level. But yeah, he's uh, he's another one who's through that sort of St. Kevin boys conveyor belt of talent. So he, he, even against that Italian midfield, he was the one Irish player who really did look as though he was comfortable in amongst them. And also, Will Smallbone is there. Will Smallbone, you might remember, with Southampton, has played in the Premier League quite a few times. He's had some really difficult injury problems. He also looked like he was slightly better than that level so maybe he's another one who can force his way into the senior team over the next while Evan Ferguson came off the bench last night he's the the superstar at Brighton yeah still what 17 just, maybe just, just gone yeah. 17 uh, so let's give him a give him a little bit of time uh, but he's at a good club we know that but, you know Brighton seemed to have a brilliant academy system uh, they were desperate to get him they've had him involved already in and around the senior side so Listen, if he gets a run of games, Brighton are obviously having an outstanding start to the season, so I can't imagine Graham Potter's going to be taking a huge amount of risks or, compared to this time last season, doesn't necessarily need a goal scorer the way he did this time last season uh, with how they're playing at the moment. So give him a couple of years as well. But, yeah, there's not the same buzz around the 21s as there was with Stephen Kenny for obvious reasons. And, you know, that Ireland-Italy game on Friday definitely felt a couple of steps below the Ireland-Italy game from a couple of years ago when... You had a star-studded Italian side, with two or three of the players went on to make the Euro squad. You had, you know, Yadida, Connolly, Paris. Uh, but still, I think for Ireland to go, to only concede that second goal in the last minute against Italy, had a brilliant chance to equalise a couple of minutes later, and then to go and beat Sweden shows that there is still enough talent. The 19s won as well yesterday. So it does feel as though there's a good bit of momentum behind things. But as we know, there's that huge step up of 19s, 21s to them actually playing first-team football for their clubs. But again, I think if you're getting two, three, four players out of every 21 squad, you'll be pretty happy with Lice. Is Crawford doing a good job? Like, I mean, you say that there's the less, like, lower profile for obvious reasons there, but uh, if, if you take away the, the result last night, have, have things been trending in the right direction under him? Well, it, it depends who you're comparing him to, I guess. And the 21s go about their business a lot more quietly when Stephen Kenny was there and they were getting huge crowds and he did seem to have a certain generation of definitely attacking players uh, who were able to elevate them to a, to another level. If you compare the 21s, what they're doing now to what Noel King was doing, where it seemed to be some sort of a, I won't say a finishing school for English-born players, but certainly the entire aim of the 21s seemed to be to keep English-born lads interested and keep them in a green jersey for as long as possible at the expense of homegrown players. I think he's doing a really good job. Like, you're just beating Sweden and you've run Italy close. As I say, it still seems 
even though the four points behind Sweden, a massive step to go to Sweden and to go to Italy and probably win both those games to qualify. But there's such a good mix in that squad now of good, homegrown, talented players. Several lads from Bowles in there. Colin Whelan started against Italy, you know, scored a huge amount of goals in the first division from UCD. There's players from around Europe. Connor Noss started the other night from Brucey Munchie Gladbach and players at the English Academy. So, like, that's what you want this to be for Ireland. Yes, if you qualify, it will be a massive, massive achievement. But I think, actually, that bringing the players along, getting them used to the system, and making the step up to the senior level be quite seamless, I think, would be good progression. Results-wise, you look at losing to Luxembourg, losing to Montenegro, it's not ideal, but... You go beat Sweden and you can counter it with the draw with uh, the performance against Italy as well. That's I, I think he's doing a I think he's doing a pretty reasonable job. I think if the last two games had gone horribly wrong, he probably would have been under a bit of pressure. But I think for Ireland, who've never qualified for a under 21s European Championship, I think it is making that step up and providing players and a route for Stephen Kenny. That that is the ultimate aim of it. Yeah, one thing about I know every country will lose their very best young players, but most countries actually have a more established senior team than we do at the moment over the last couple of years as a result of all the things that have come before and that lost generation that we've spoken about a million times. So it would be unusual for you to lose five players who are as uh, senior as the... Uh, Republic of Ireland have lost. If you look at you know even the the best young English players, there's always a slew of players coming through um, that they can still pick Premier League starters in in many positions too. So look at seven forty one. I'm going to tell you what's coming up between now and ten o'clock on the show here on OTBAM. Nathan's with us on the way until about five past eight. Gregor Paul is going to rejoin us to talk to us about the New Zealand assessment of what happened to them at the weekend. Orla McGrath is going to talk to us about Camogie at eight thirty. Sports pages 845. Finn Lynch, one of our best sailors, uh, finished with a silver medal in the World Championship at the weekend. We're going to talk to him about that and going to hear from Sean Ingle at half past nine about uh, a dark day for English cricket as um, the Media and Sports Select Committee at Westminster had Azim Rafiq before them yesterday detailing the racism that he suffered um, in two spells as a player at Yorkshire. Uh, that's all coming up between now and 10 o'clock. If you want to get in touch with us, we'd love to hear from you. 0879 180 180 is the WhatsApp number. Uh, OTBAM is live with Gillette, proud sponsors of Movember. Gentlemen, let's mow. Your mow's coming along nicely. Thank you, as is yours. And the handlebar thing is going to be tricky to pull off. When, when are you planning on doing it? I mean, I'm, I'm doing it now. So, but like, I mean, are you not going to twirl it or something like that? Is that how oh, it well, It'll be saying? Christmas before it actually okay. happens. Um, Nathan, I, I know you love charity. Oh, sorry, you hate charity. That's what it says. Uh, oh, you just decided you couldn't do it. You, you were too embarrassed by last year's kind of dead caterpillar. It's, it's not. Well, if I'd you. known, if I'd known uh, that you were essentially allowed to cheat at November as you have done, Jer, and start several weeks beforehand, I, I could just do what you've done and start right now and don't shave off it. the beard and just leave yeah, the tash. Do it. Do it. But the, I thought the whole aim was you shave it all off on the first of November and you see where you are at the end of November. That's what I did last year. And to so you, horrific results. You decided you could. It was a once in a lifetime experience. You weren't going to do it again. Exactly. Nobody. Nobody appreciated it. But I'm very impressed with uh, both your efforts. <laughs> He does love charity. It's a nice compliment there at the end. That's a, that's a good charitable donation. You're right. I think we, we both cheated, didn't we? I think we both got in a couple of days early um, because we're uh, uh, des- desperately insecure, I think, is probably the, the, the real reason for that. Let's talk about what happened at Derby County yesterday and, and the impact that's going to have on the Republic of Ireland. Uh, another points deduction because they've just been really, really badly run. And uh, we're assuming that that guarantees relegation to League One next year. Is that is that the case? Oh, it's sort of a mountain to climb, isn't it? From <laughs> uh, even the mentally, what it must do to the players to find yourselves in that position where actually, you know, they'd made quite a bit of progress at the start of the season to get themselves, give themselves half a decent chance, despite the initial points deduction of, of staying in the league. But to go back again, uh, like this will be, geez, like when Rudy's getting a good job, if he can keep Derby in the championship after this points deduction, we're obviously looking at it from a, an Irish point of view and. Uh, Jason Knight at 20 years of age uh, that if they're relegated Jason Knight is not going to be playing in League One football next season so where does he end up and actually you know, do they need the money in January do they need to go and uh, look at doing a deal and is now the time for him to get out of Derby and, and get a move maybe to a Premier League club maybe to a top championship side over the next couple of months so yeah I can you see Derby surviving? I just think this is such a mental setback for them. You can't, you can't really it's... see them survive. I mean, so they're 18 points off safety. Oh, no, is it four go down? Or is it three go down? 
Uh, so either way, it's uh, 18 points off safety and they've only got 18 points from the first 17 games of the season. So mm. they need to massively outperform their first half, um, assuming that there's some uptick in, in performance. It's not impossible, but uh, it probably seems impossible at this stage. <laughs> Yeah, they'd need basically playoff form. So if they're minus 21 points, they probably need to get to about 60, 61 to survive in the championship, which would almost get you into the playoffs. So listen, maybe the fact that they were able to do that already shows that they're just about good enough to survive, but I, I just can't see it. It's, a, it's even better than playoff form, to be honest, because if you, if you take the points they are behind now and uh, the teams who are higher up the table, like... Yeah, uh, the the second half of the season would actually put them top of the table to get safety, if everybody performs at the same level they've been at close enough. So, um, so they're gone. Will they sell Jason Knight straight away, or do they try and keep him to the end of the season? What's the point of keeping him to the end of the season if you're already gone? I don't know. Is it better for him to go? And where would we like him to go? Because we don't want him to go to a club where it's going to be, oh, come and sit in the bench for us for eighteen months. We were like, get in and play every week. Well, do you want him to you know, go to a Bournemouth or a Fulham who look like the two best teams in the championship or are heading to the Premier League and you get half a season playing in the championship and then you do enough to impress the manager that you should be starting in the Premier League next season? You're right. The one place you don't want to end up is signing for Norwich where you know, your faith is pretty much uh, set in stone that you're going to be back playing championship If he football plays football season. for Norwich for every game in the Premier League this season, I'd be happy enough with that. But like, if you look at what they've done where Billy Gilmore can't get a game, like... That that you know that would concern you. Now, new manager comes in, and if Dean Smith signs him, then it's like right, he's his guy, as opposed to inheriting him. Like if Steven Gerrard signs him and decides, yeah, like yeah, my my mate told me to sign you. He says you're great, and he gets straight in the Villa team. I'm like great because mm. he could play there, but there's not many other teams in the Premier League he's going to get into. Is he getting straight into the Villa side? Marvel and the Camba playing every game at the moment yeah it, it's still a give me give me some nice sizable uh step up from yeah he is still very young so for any 20 year old to burst in to a premier league side and start playing every week in midfield I, like billy gilmore is a good example billy gilmore described as the best talent scottish talent of his generation <laughs> and bizarrely can't get in the Norwich team. And maybe that's because he's come through a Chelsea academy system where they play a certain style of football. And actually, Billy Gilmore only works at a Chelsea. He only works at a top quality team and doesn't really work in a relegation scrap. Whereas Jason Knight, you sort of feel with his style of play, uh, probably would work in a relegation scrap. But like, there's still a bit to go, I think, with Jason Knight. He was outstanding, clearly, off the bench. You want to see him start doing it from the start of games, you think of the one competitive game he started, I think, was against Luxembourg, which yeah. was... Nobody uh, played well. Not, <laughs> nobody played well. Uh, maybe played one of the Nations League games uh, as well from the start. But I think that's where, say, Bennett has been so impressive, actually, because in one way, it's easy to come on the last 20 minutes of a match and wreak havoc. To come on and do it from the start of a game and to play back-to-back -back games and maybe struggle at the start of the game against Portugal, but in the second half, you know, he's the one who took the game to them, even with that ploy, which is clearly a tactical ploy that Ireland have, which is give it to Ben a right at kickoff and just get him to run straight at the opposition. Good Old idea. Merchant style. And that was well, both, both, on both occasions, it resulted in a free kick. One of them in a really dangerous position against Portugal. The other one against uh, uh, the last night against Luxembourg wasn't quite in the same position. But it's a brilliant tactic, actually, it turns out. That's the end result every time. But I think there's a big step up, and I've gone and shown it from making an impression for 20 minutes to being able to get in and involved. And probably that's what we need Jason Knight to do, to come in, to start games, and to have a level of control in those games that actually you're making still the same amount of impact over the course of 70, 80 minutes as you are in the space of 20 minutes. But that that's time. That just takes time. It, it, it's really interesting when we kind of look at the, the chart of these players and if you had a, a hat for football manager, where, where you would actually let them go? Because it does feel that like the Norwich thing is maybe bit more of an outlier like you had Ali McCoy the other night on the, the Scotland game and having a dig at Norwich being like that's some team that Norwich team that Billy Gilmore can't get into it because he was obviously excellent for, for Scotland but I wonder have we just kind of got a little bit stung by maybe Oma Bamadeli granted he's in there now uh, but at the start of the season and, and obviously Adam Eda that they're kind of like a, a separate scenario because if you look at all the other players it seems that maybe Aaron Connolly 
I think that the blame is kind of at his door in terms of uh, his own lack of progression over the last little while. We can't really point to to a club. That the, what are the other situations in the Premier League where we've where an Ireland player has been uh, harshly treated? And we had, don't have any. Yeah. Through. So like I, I actually just think that um, maybe Fark and now he's gone uh, was per, perhaps a, a harsh judge of a of a young character and, and a young player that maybe Jason Nice might surprise a few people by actually making that jump up to, to a lower Premier League team. It may take a couple of seasons for it to happen, but but I think maybe we've been a little bit stung by by all of our collective Norwich experiences. Yeah, and every player is different, every manager is different, and as Jer said, Dean Smith comes in at Norwich and may have a very different way of looking at things. I think it's definitely going to be more difficult for Adam Ida to make the breakthrough at Norwich mm. than it is for Andrew Mabamadele. Uh, but that is what Premier League managers do. They trust the older players, you, know, you talk to any manager and say there's always a bit of inconsistency with younger players that you just have to accept. And when you're in a relegation scrap and you know you're going to be in that, that's probably just a little bit of a risk that you don't really want to take. Wouldn't it be nice to see Jason Knight maybe go abroad? It's highly unlikely to happen, but to go and find yourself a... Borussia you know, Dortmund. Well, <laughs> just go to Borussia Dortmund there, Jason, and uh, lay things on a plate for Erling Haaland Inter for six Milan. months. Yeah. I like, mean, look. But those, those sort of, it doesn't need to be uh, Borussia Dortmund. Go to a PSV Eindhoven or go somewhere where there's a different style of football and uh, you can learn something slightly different. But you'd expect it'll be a, it'll be a Premier League or a higher up Championship side that he. Uh, that'd be all right. Ends we, up would, in. we would take that. Um, or is Celtic a, a possibility in any of this? I don't know. I mean. Um, the Celtic fans very unhappy with the fact that uh, they're signing Danny Mandrew. They're suspicious of the the channels with which this uh, player has arrived, saying that he doesn't fit the style of play. Is this a good move? Is this something that we're thinking is a, a good career prospect? I, I, I can't see a downside from his perspective because if he can make the team, then fair play to him and it's going to be a step up immediately for him. So I don't know. Like uh, uh, Celtic fans being... Precious about stuff is not new, uh, so what, what's your what's your instinct on this? It's a good move for Danny Madreu. I think personally for him, uh, there's no question. If the opportunity comes to sign for Celtic, you're always going to take it. And Liam Scales has made the same trip just a couple of months back and is already starting to get himself involved around the first team. Uh, Celtic supporters are obviously looking at the Dermot Desmond connection and thinking like, is this is this a feeder club for us now? Yeah, these players at the level that we want of a feeder club? Do we have to take a Shamrock Rovers player every transfer window for a certain fee to keep everyone happy? Uh, and Celtic supporters still see themselves as, you know, being a big club that they should be going into the transfer market. Is he gonna is he gonna be the difference in a title race for them against Rangers in the final months of the season? Uh, they probably look at what he's done for Shamrock Rovers and is it 14, 15 goals this season and say is that proof enough that he can make a real contribution? But for him, I think it's a it's an absolute no-brainer. And then you just got to take your chances. You just got to, when you get on that pitch, score some goals, win them over. It's the same for any young player going over there. It's, you know, Liam Scales, you're coming in as a left-back or as a centre-back. You know, you can probably go about your business quietly. But as a striker at Celtic, if you're on the pitch, they're going to expect you to score goals. And you know, Mandreo at times is hit and miss. He's you know, clearly a lovely technical footballer and has been crucial for Shamrock Rovers winning the title this season and has scored plenty of goals. Uh, I haven't seen enough of Celtic to say exactly where he is going to fit in, but well, I'd assume ask, they're signing him. Is it possible that he can play a little bit deeper? I think he can. Not, you often uh, see him for Shamrock Rovers dropping deep, getting himself involved, and you know seems very, very comfortable at doing that. But I, I think that, again, is the problem that when you go to a club the size of Celtic and you're signed as a striker, that they expect you to score goals yeah. and doing the other work uh, can get you as much stick as anything else. But yeah, hopefully he does get those opportunities because it's, you know, again, it's a blow to the League of Ireland uh, to see a Danny Mandreo leave and the talent that Danny Mandreo has. But here, Jack Byrne, it seems, is coming back. So maybe it's a nice old swap for Shamrock Rovers. OK, there's two quick other stories we want to talk to you about um, in golf and gay football. Before that, I want to tell everybody about our Cabri Roadshow, which is coming up. Arsenal and Ireland fans don't want to miss our next Cabri FC Roadshow. We're going behind the scenes with the Arsenal Invincible Robert Pires and also Gunner star and Ireland captain Katie McKay will be joined by former Arsenal strength and conditioning coach and Ireland rugby legend Jerry Flannery as well. It's all thanks to Cabri FC and their club partnerships granting you behind-the-scenes access at the Premier League's biggest clubs coming soon to OTB Sports social channels. I want to have a listen to this. It's the football pod with Paddy and Andy. It's back. 
after Tommy's holidays. Former cabin footballer Kian Mackey, who's now starring for Longford Club Mullinyakta, is the special guest this week. But before Kian joins the pod, Andy gets talking about Mayo losing another of their generational talents to the AFL, Oshin Mullen. Have a listen. He could go huge, but I think what's what's key for him is the club that he's went to. He's went to Geelong and uh, a girl from the old ladies team is over there, Rachel Cairns. Obviously, Zach is over there. Mark Connor is over there. Um, that gives good contingent it a, there from already. Yeah. A, good, a good contingent. His age too. Like what what has always struck me about Pierce Handy is Pierce goes over there at eighteen years of age, yeah. right, and stays there. Now Begley was gone. Colin Beggs was probably gone about uh, two years after Pierce was over. I'd say. And Handy yeah. stuck it out and made a career for himself. Like that is unbelievable. If that wasn't sport, now if that was just business, and you were going over there making a career over there, and by thirty you'd done what he had done and stuck at a career that long and going over at eighteen years of age. You know, you'd be in, you'd be, the, it, a, you'd be in the business. You'd be in the business post, like you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah. You're, you're a baby. You're, yeah. you're, you're, a, you're an absolute baby. Whereas you go over at maybe 22, yeah. 21, 22. Those, you know, you can huge development over those two. You or can, two. yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Whereas at eighteen, you're coming out of secondary school. Yeah. You haven't been to college. You're, you haven't. You don't know anything. No, <laughs> like, I, I, you I, think I, you know things, but you don't. And yeah. you make it. So I just think with Oshin, I just think it's going to, like he is three, four years there where he can elevate his career. He can go after it. Them guys are going to look after him. Zach Tui set the marker for them at the club. Yeah. They're a real competitive club. They're right up there. Yeah. And like, like I, I've said this before, I rate footballers in kind of percentages, the top 5%, and an athletic form and strength and power and everything that you need. Hey, and looks. He's got oh, the yeah. X factor. I the best looking man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you imagine that man in the best, but and the pink boots and the hair and the ponytail. But he, like he's a top, yeah, he's a top five percent athlete. And the point Paddy is trying to make there is that your Mayo, you produce yeah. possibly if you're lucky three or four of these every ten years, and he's one of them, and he's gone, and we've lost two in the last twenty, which is which is hard to take. They're the margins. Yeah. Listen, best luck to him. Amazing. Oh, Class. Hey, you know, great to see it. As a person, as a young fella, as a as a, as a human being, he's just, he's an incredible, like, this is why I think there's, he, he can do whatever he wants, because he, he, he like, I know I, I, I sound like a dad now when I'm going to say this, but. He, he, <laughs> you he, are a dad, you he, are a dad. He's, 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 he's got manners, like, he, he walks into a room, there's no airs or graces about him, he walks in, he fits in with the group, and he's just, he, he's just, one, he's just absolutely brilliant at kind of everything, like, he's just one of those guys, so, Listen, he can do whatever he wants in the, in yeah. the world and fair play to him. Can't wait to see what he does next. Right. Get him on the pod, Paddy, or Tommy. Hoping to. Tommy, come on, will you? Let's see what <laughs> happens. <laughs> that's, what this, that's what this last five minutes has been about. Where I'm just going to send it on to him. See if he can <laughs> Anyways. Right. Nathan, they used you in the in the hype video. You and Richie and Joe were the ones hyping up the g fans. Oh, my fans. God. Oh, my God. I, I, I couldn't believe when I saw this last uh, week. They cut out the bit at the start where we said that this was a disaster, an unmitigated disaster from AO that O'Sheen Mullen was leaving. They left that bit out and left in the bit where we were just talking about what a talented footballer he was, as if the people of Mayo and the people of Ireland were just delighted to see their best young footballer leave the country. Uh, but yes, the, uh, they didn't apologise to the Geelong social media staff, but it's, uh, it's fine. We won't take legal action uh, just yet. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, disappointing. It's uh, damaging. But I think I, I agree with what I think Goldman was saying last week that Mayo will find a way to win a lot of big championship games without him. But you do wonder when it comes to All Ireland finals, you know, would a Pierce Hanley have made a difference? We just will never know. Yeah, would no, a we do Mullen know. Have we made do a know. Over the next decade, we absolutely know that Pierce Hanley would have made a difference. You drew some All Ireland. You're saying he's not worth a single point. Of course he is. No, but if Pierce Hanley stays in Balladhadreen. Who knows, maybe he gets waylaid along the way and he doesn't become, you know, Mayo's central midfielder for the next 10 years. Things can happen, but... Things can happen. That's with Mullen. There'll always be... Things ha- can happen. Things always do happen, Gerard. Some you know. young one in Balladhadreen would turn his head and that'd be the end of it. She'd move him down to Cork wasn't or something better stupid off, wasn't like that. better off. <laughs> Likewise with O'Sheen Mullen. That, that's the subtext Kilmaine. of that. The nightlife in, Kil- the nightlife in Kilmaine is, oh, hardcore. So he's better off out of it, isn't he? No. Um, I look. I, I I just think it's interesting that this happens less and less to some of the other co- counties. Like uh, the Dubs got Kieran Kilkenny back after six months. Whatever they needed to do, they did. Stefan Cumber has has come back now. Mark O'Connor's still down there. Yes, so. a teammate of of Oshin Um Um, 
Like that's like uh, 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 Clifford he, was not allowed to go. Yeah. Why? Why is? Why is there not like? Why is there not some? Look, look, your life here will be better. This is what we're saying your life will be. This is the offer we're making you in in educational terms and financial terms. Is there not, was there not something that somebody could have done? I mean, there's, there's a lot of... Bring back Tim O'Leary, bring back Tim O'Leary. Well, uh, whoever, whoever, there, I'm yeah, sure there are loads of There's a few different scenarios that you're talking about there. And one of them, and I think I said that when this came out of, like, and maybe that has happened in the background where people have said, listen, what can we do to make it worth your while to stay here in Mayo, to stay here in Ireland? And he decided, actually, I just want to go and I want to have this experience. But some of those players have gone and come back. This is, look at Tyrone, players have gone and come back. So he hasn't even gone yet. So let's see how he settles in down to Geelong. Let's see how things go for him. Yeah. And who knows, maybe in a year's time he's decided this isn't for me. Like Pierce Hanley is a is a great success story uh, and somebody that I think an awful lot of people in Mayo are very proud of what he's achieved. But because of what it's been at the sacrifice of, from a Mayo point of view, there's always a part of you that go, what might have been? And while people want to see Yoshin Mullen do well, I'd imagine an awful lot of people would love if actually he got over there in six months time and said, no, nah, I'm a little bit homesick. I'm back. And he'd be welcome with open arms. Um, very quickly, uh, Greg Norman and Roy McElroy are in the news. We've got about two mm. and a half minutes to do this. Um, what, what's going on? So obviously, go on. There's a lot going on. There's a lot going on. So we've heard for, well, years at this stage about a rival to the PGA and European Tour backed by Saudi money. And it's taken its first real steps over the past couple of months where Greg Norman has come in to run a company that is going to get involved with the Asian tour that is backed by Saudi money and is going to put itself up as a rival to the PGA Tour, huge prize funds, and is going to try and lure the very best players in the world to come and play on his tour instead of the PGA Tour. Now, this isn't the Premier Golf League, which is also backed by Saudi money, which is a slightly different thing, which would mean you have to totally leave the PGA Tour, that you would give up your PGA Tour status, you maybe give up your major status, and you basically get maybe 30 million, 40 million pounds guaranteed every year to go and play in this. They're only looking for the best 24, 25 players in the world. Hasn't really taken off at all. This feels like more of a soft entry. Like Greg Norman, uh, notorious for basically going wherever the money is, is the face of this and maybe gives it a legitimate face for some people. But Rory McIlroy is over in Dubai for the DP World Tour finale uh, playing this week. He's also head of the Players Advisory Committee on the PGA Tour, which is the most influential role a player has. So it's understandable he has come out and said, this is not for me under any circumstances. Cannot see why I do it. And I also really double down because Norman is the most high profile appointment, but behind the scenes, it seems a few retired former PGA Tour officials have also joined to give them a bit more leverage. And McElroy said, when I saw about those appointments, my stance has been hardened even more that there is no way I'm going. So a little bit of a war brewing between the two tours. It'll be interesting, does anybody jump ship? The sense at the moment is that it's the veterans that they're looking at, so a Phil Mickelson, or if he ever gets back fully fit, a Tiger Woods, uh, a version of the Champions Tour that none of the Dustin Johnsons, Brooke Kepkas, Jordan Speeds, Rory McIlroy's right now are ready to go, but if one of them was to move, maybe a few of them would move, and then you do have a proper, proper split in golf where you don't see the best players playing against each other, but it does seem McElroy, McElroy is the golden egg in all of this. He is by far the biggest current star in the sport. He's probably the most influential player in the sport by a mile. And if he ain't going, I think it's going to be very hard for any of the other leading players to go as well. So we're going to see more Saudi money coming into golf. We're going to see players probably play some of these Asian events and take a little bit of it. Well, that's but I don't it. think we're going to see too many of them. That's the genius move, going, isn't it? Align, jump ship. Aligning with the, the Asian tour. And saying, oh, no, no, we're completely legitimate. We're just part of this. It's just an extra... It's like the, a Rolex series, except it's backed by Saudi money. It's, it's well, the, and remember, the Saudi Invitational uh, has been taking place for the last few years, and Dustin Johnson has gone over and won well, this. And Dustin Johnson, when you say he's not going to go, players. he might go. I can see him well, going. I, I just think none of them want to go right now unless they knew that six or seven more of them were going. And he's still at an age where he's... you know in the top three in the world. He's one of the best players. He's contending for majors. Just won the Masters last year. Think about the hello actually, money for him right now if he was to do it. Like, guaranteed I still 100 million over the next 10 years. Maybe slightly too much. Okay. But I, I think from a business point of view, look, the clearest sign that this is sports washing is the players that they do think they're going to get. The Tigers, the Phils, the Ernie Els, Greg Normans. 
because nobody has any interest in seeing them playing in reality. Nobody cares. The Champions Tour is on every Sunday night and all these guys are playing against each other. Nobody cares. If you are doing this, make the sport better. You have to get the very best current players in the world. So I think this is a nice little sideshow. And they say maybe what's happening with the Asian Tour will be the more damaging long-term for golf in the way it just lets people ease in. Yeah. All right, Nathan, good stuff. Thanks a million. Cheers. Cheers, lads. Five past eight this morning here on OTBAM. We're live with Gillette, proud sponsors of Movember. Gentlemen, let's mow. We're going to get the view from New Zealand. Gregor Paul is going to rejoin us next.